takes me long to lectures like this sometimes. It's a good time. Um, so <laughs> 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 My name is Camilla. Um, yeah, I'm interested in religion and psychology and philosophy and stuff. Yeah, that's what we're going to get into. Anushka, uh, I'm going to get my PhD there. Mm. You know about like, Sri Lankan Buddhism? Yeah, Buddhism. You know me, and this is Trent who's giving the talks. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, so I just finished teaching new religious movements. Mm. So my head's full of spaceships and I'm marking stuff. I'm Gab. So I'm a final year. University, uh, particularly related to manuscript study in um, Thailand. I do some sort of like translation, translation, and like examination of the text from from Thai Khmer um, cultural sphere. Yeah. Hi, I'm Prai Modin. I'm a PhD candidate, and I'm working on the Life of Buddha. I translated from Thai into English. Yeah, it's a. Yeah, well, sorry, sorry to sort of come into the time, but I just thought it's nice to welcome, and, and you know, so you know, yeah, thank you here as well. Um, welcome back to those who are uh, tuning in. Um, I'm again, I'm Ben Chantal. I'm the head of the religion program here, and on behalf of the religion program at the University of Otago and the Dhamma Kai Education Foundation, we're very pleased to uh, have our fourth in this series of lectures. Uh, by Dr. Trent Walker. Um, those of you, it seems like most of you have been here on the other lectures, but as before, we're recording it um, and we with plans, as you've just heard, to upload it to a YouTube channel once we get the permission to make a YouTube channel. Um, I just was, in, in previous um, lectures, I was sort of giving little bits of Trent's bio. And just one thing I, I wanted to mention, I was going to mention yesterday that I, I hadn't mentioned before is that um, Trent has done work as Director of Preservation and Lead Scholar for the Khmer Manuscript Heritage Project, uh, which is a part or is an initiative of the Buddhist Digital Resource Center to digitize 1.5 million pages of palm leaf manuscript texts in Khmer, Pali, uh, uh, and CMEs from Cambodian libraries and rural monasteries. Um, this kind of project is really important in the field of Buddhist studies and um, takes a lot of effort and I've never done it myself, but just something that I want to recognize you for here as well, in addition to all your academic achievements and books and all the rest of it. So um, uh, just wanted to say that. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will hand back over to you, Trent. So. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. And thank you so much for your kindness. Thank you all for, for being here, those who've been here the whole time and who are joining uh, us now. And uh, again, those of you who are joining on Zoom, um, if you would like to, no pressure at all. If you would like to ask any questions at this time, you're also welcome. If you're comfortable, we can cut it out of the recording later. If you would like to introduce yourself, you are completely, totally welcome. But I know the feeling of being on the other side and not wanting to pipe up at all in this, these kind of settings. <laughs> but I just, just know that I really appreciate your, your presence, and we all do, and, and your contributions to everything that's gone on so far. And a special note to the people of the future who are watching this, <laughs> you know, you're, you're missing out on this experience of having it live. And then of course, we're live over Zoom, but um, we appreciate you too. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, I, hope, I hope you're getting something out of this. And this applies to you, people of the future, as well as all of us here. If you have questions after this time, feel free to, to, to email me or get in touch. Happy to talk about these things. So today I thought we could be a little bit more relaxed, if that's okay. I would love to hear a bit more from all of you as we look at some of the text together. And part of this is because the theme for today, that of shock, is one that I've, I've worked on before and I have things to say about it. But the topic of shock is no longer shocking to me. So I want to be refreshed, re-shocked by your shock as we look through texts that deal with this, these kinds of themes. So if, if I can uh, beg your um, indulgence 
not exactly thoughts, it doesn't have to be contributions, but just your co-thinking um, as we work through uh, these questions. I'm gonna try to see it with new eyes too, instead of, I could give you the way that I've usually framed these things, but let's just look at the text together and see what um, we've found. If you're interested in some of the ways that I have thought about this theme of shock or aesthetic shock or shaking or quaking, this term that, um, various ways that I'm trying to capture this uh, indic term, some vega, um, that's very important with regards to Buddhist poems that are trying to arouse a sense of horror in the face of impermanence and death, that are trying dis to dislodge a kind of complacency in the face of the inevitable suffering of life from a Buddhist perspective. And I've looked at it in two main ways. One is in terms of the pairing of this term samvega with another term basada. Basada or prasada in Sanskrit has this sense of, of stilling or calming or settling. Three different meanings of this term, but this is the particular one that's relevant in this context. Um, and it, literally this term uh, Basada comes from the verb um, basidati, which is this settling down, kind of the way if you can imagine you have a, a glass filled with muddy water. If you let it settle, the particles will go to the bottom and the glass will become clear. So that clarity is the other way of translating or understanding this term basada. And these, this basada and some vega from some vij, like the sense of shaking. These are often paired in uh, certain poetic traditions in Southeast Asia, as, whether, as well as broader uh, ways of teaching certain Buddhist ideas. So that's been one of the ways that I've um, investigated and looked at this idea of um, being stirred, being shaken, being shocked um, by how these, these, these poems are framed. And that, this pairing of these two terms and the relationship between melody, text, and doctrine is something that I uh, found um, through some of the teachers that I studied um, Cambodian Buddhist chant uh, with. Um, and I'll just let you hear the voice of these two teachers who um, help me reframe what was going on in certain kinds of Buddhist poems along these ideas of shock, that is Sakalai Samway and Kamai or Samwega and Pali or Sanskrit, and uh, or the sense of stilling, um, that of Basad or Sakalai Jretla and Kamai. So let's just listen a little bit to um, Bao Ranj. You'll hear her voice first, and then followed by Prum uh, Ut. And these are two teachers with whom I, I studied in Cambodia, uh, who lived in Kapong Spu uh, province. <laughs> Sankara, 
บัดกรุบมุกเตียงยกเตียงสั่งเอยมัดนายเอาปุกปมเบียนสัลตุกเตลุกเอยดอ So what do you hear? What do you notice? And if you're joining us over Zoom, feel free to anything that comes to mind. Feel free to put it in the chat. So I guess the first thing that strikes me is just that a female male thing that you get in Cambodia, where they do one and then they do the other. So there's always this gendered pair. And it's true of all yeah. Dharma song. Like what? It's particularly mm -hmm. Cambodian. Yeah, it's not the most common mode of performance. Most often, this text would be done just by a single voice. Um, but when it's possible, and they have two people whose voice vocal ranges can um, either be on the same pitch or an octave apart, and that's comfortable within their vocal range. Um, This this sometimes occurs. We have evidence, even in inscriptions going back to the 18th century, of two voice performances mm -hmm. for these kinds of of texts. In that case, it's for it was young novices are being described doing that, um, but it continues in the present more often with lay people, but sometimes with monastics as well. I'm thinking of like EK and stuff like that. You know, I mean yes. that whole yes Cambodian. Absolutely. Between the yes, yeah. and that we see in all kinds of uh, artistic yeah. and vocal traditions beyond um, Cambodia, certainly in the Lao context, certainly in the Thai context, all kinds of uh, vocal repartee between male and female voices is very much there. Here it's you know, a different context, but it's interesting that it has that kind of resonance. Yeah. I mean, just the tone of, of the song is, it's, It's play like it's sorrow mm. yeah, rather than so. just um yeah, and that's what lead them and um we have yeah. written so agony and pain whether that's just listening from my background or that's what it may mean to convey because it's in the words yeah yeah so there's absolutely it's something that we're hearing in the melody or in the what's happening vocally but also what's happening in the words because you were Be able to read what's what's going on, and then uh, Quian says that was so beautiful. There's a slight mournful tone, mm -hmm. and so uh, this question of what this mournful tone is, where is it located? How do we find it? What does that mean? Is it intentional? Is it not? Is something that I've tried to think about. Um, from others of you here in the room, anything else you notice or you have a question about? There's no. No observation is inconsequential. Thanks. Uh, I feel that the tone of the singers reflect the truth about uh, not impermanence. Mm -hmm. Nothing is last forever. Mm -hmm. It has to like be destroyed, mm -hmm. decays eventually, right? And it's reflect to cut and set. Unsatisfactory, yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah, but I has a kind of a, a doubt about how if nothing ever lasts, right? How can a person attain the the Buddha gems which lead them to the city of Nirvana in your next poem, your poem number uh, 30. <laughs> Five and thirty-six oh. seem like some something, some essence still exists, but <laughs> which lead our consciousness to 
the immortal city of Nirvana somewhere like that. Yeah, well, that's um, first of all a great observation around this relationship between mm. the sound and the sound of impermanence, if that, but the sound of the curve, you know, unsatisfactoriness or suffering, distress, etc. Um, but on this second point, that's of course a eternal, if I may say so, question in the Buddhist context and one that Buddhist philosophers and people within Buddhist faces have, have wondered about. How does this idea of anatta, um, that things that we ordinarily think of as somehow me or mine are not that, what does that mean for uh, particular Buddhist ideas of soteriology, that is, Buddhist case of a path to liberation of achievement of nirvana or Buddhahood, et cetera. And that is not always fully worked out or specified in the texts. That's the, the very simple answer to the, to the question. Um, but I think something that we should pay attention to in these texts that are on the surface about Samvega, on the surface about this shock with the encounter with impermanence or death. There's also instructions that are given with regards to achieving the path of awakening. How do these sit within the same poem? I think that's a question we can ask. I think we'll be challenging to ask the, the broader question about how certain doctrines uh, can, can fit together, but in a microscopic way, uh, we can examine that question as we look forward through these poems. I don't know if I'd say they're about some vega, they evoke some vega, you yeah, know? Yeah, they make you sure. The, 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 I mean, the, the, the thing that really comes to mind, I've never thought about it until this moment, is that actually, Camilla, it's good that you're here, because maybe you had this experience. Often I teach, when I teach intro to Buddhism, we get to some point in thinking about the Dharma, and there is an experience of like, total despond, being totally despondent about the world. You know, like uh, if you talk about anatta or whatever, and I've had some students regularly almost every semester come up to me after one of the classes and just talk about like how depressing it all is and all that. And I've never said to them, and I think it's something I could say now, or, I mean, you don't have to take Buddhism, but just look at global warming, right? I mean, we all experience the feeling of some big total, it's not quite hopelessness, but it's, yeah, it's sort of shock or whatever, at the, in, at the impermanence, I think it's right. Um, and look, this is this is a kind of emotion. This is in the aesthetic repertoire of Buddhism. This is an experience that is documented. It, 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 I've never thought about pairing it with Posada. I don't know if that's a sort of a canonical move. Like, I don't know if that, I mean, I would ask you if that is something that is considered, if Posada is considered to be the antidote to some vague, I've never thought about it in that way. I thought about it two separate things, but even being able to kind of identify the emotion is, as we know in psychoanalysis, it's, it's important, right? So, um, yeah, that, that this experience, that, 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 that even, even the most advanced, you know, kind of sort of Buddhist steeped in the tradition experience some Vega, I can say that to students, you know, this, this is an emotion, this is a Buddhist emotion you're feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, please. Um, I found it interesting that, yeah, there's a sense of like despair in the singing, um, but um, from things that I've heard about Buddhism, this idea of um, maybe some sort of like relief when you allow yourself to, to feel these things. Um, idea of there's like, there's a freedom in acknowledging and like letting go and like fully stepping into, um, yeah, these kind of realities. Um, and I also found it interesting that it's it's sung and singing is it's inherently ecstatic in the sense that a singer allows himself to to step into the song and be taken in by it. Um, it you know, like doctrinally, it's not like you're meant to like read it in a monotone voice, you know, it's kind of interesting that it's it's performed in song. Absolutely. And that um, that link between the sound of the poems 
is one that we see, of course, here in this example I've raised, but everything else that we've sort of read, read and discussed together over the past few days is also um, written for oral performance and has uh, that both aesthetic dimension to it, but also just even more simply an oral dimension to it uh, that I, we always have to contend with when trying to understand what's, what's going on. I think this question of aesthetics and emotions is, is really complex. Are Samvega and Basada aesthetic states or experiences or orientations, or are they emotional or affective states? Obviously, these are all kind of contested terms, but I think it also, it's significant for how we interpret what's going on. Mm -hmm. Are these songs evoking some way or are they about some way? Or what does that uh, mean? Um, very briefly to your mm -hmm. earlier point, um, some way and Posada do not appear as such paired in most texts in the, in the, in the, in the that there's mm -hmm. some pairing in the um, um, but most of that pairing happens in post-canonical text. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the Mahavangsa, the opening, the beginning, the ends of each of the chapters, the, the yeah. chapters yeah. that evoke that, all kinds of other um, commentary mm -hmm. literature discusses these terms together. Mm -hmm. So there, there are ways in which they're being paired. And certainly Gauran, uh, the woman whose voice you heard, she um, emphasized that the point of mm -hmm. these kinds of songs is to evoke uh, either Samvega or Pasada in the listener. That's the, <laughs> that's the point. Um, and so that speaks to this question, is that an aesthetic kind of approach or is it trying mm -hmm. to evoke an emotional experience? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've thought about this within a, a South Asian discourse around Rasa. That is the- I was just the, thinking, the, yeah. the, Literally the juice or the essence yeah. of an emotion. Uh, one that can be uh, appreciated aesthetically as when it appears in the context of enjoying a, a play. And that's sort of the, uh, the context in which Rasa theory was developed by Abhinavagupta and others. Mm -hmm. But it, it's another way of understanding what's going on in how Gauran is framing things, even though she doesn't use that term. There are terms similar to that in, in Khmer, for instance, um, I know, I'm not sure if there's a similar term in Thai, atarot. Um, is that a term used in Thai? Atarot. How would you explain or understand what that term means? This is literally artha plus rasa. So, so somehow this meaning and, and rasa being uh, combined together. When it's used in a Khmer context, atrua has this sense of the, the aesthetic essence of a particular line of, of poetry, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's different than like the, the strict literal meaning. It's something else that we're, mm -hmm. we're getting out of it. So in a sense, this sanwega or in other kinds of poems, there's something else. Yeah, you were gonna say? Yeah, yeah, in the sense of the, the term atarot, atar yeah. is mean the words. Yes. And ra, rot is from rasa. It's, it's the taste. Yes. The taste of the words or the feeling regarding to. But, but it's taste, taste in the sense of not just the way it tastes, but the, a taste for. Um, so it's the, the a taste feeling. of and a taste for is that is the, what's, I think, unique about the rasa, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Anushka, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, I was thinking that although it is like, uh, I'm like going to build it up on what he has said, like it's just, uh, it is shocking at the same time, it's sad at the same time, it's a joy at the end, like because you understand everything and it's beautiful because it's sung. Yes. So it's kind of understanding in a very rhythmic way also, something like that. Yes, yes, yes. And so, uh, Somehow those are coming together in this this complex way, and it's hard to I find it's hard to disentangle all the levels that's yeah. happening. Something that's maybe not happening for us, or at least we haven't notated it, but maybe Liedem, this is what you were uh, alluding to as well. For many Cambodians, when hearing these songs, it have, it can be scary and can evoke ghosts because they're most often performed to 
day in the context of funerals. Mm -hmm. In the past, these were um, used at funerals, but also really important in end of life rituals. Some of the texts we'll look at later today are really focused on this end of life context, which is a bit different than in the context of a, of a funeral. But there's still this sense in which these are really scary mm -hmm. and in that sense, powerful texts. Mm -hmm. Um, Guyen, you mentioned listening to the clip. I'm also reminded of the Vietnamese way of singing poetry, which is a particular way of singing that to me makes even joyful or neutral poems sound suddenly weirdly sad and desolate. This is kind of interesting in, in the, along the lines of what you were um, saying, Anushka, because there's also this sense, even though it's sad, there's this kind of joy in it too, because it's singing. Um, here's another way of understanding it. Perhaps there's something specific about the methodology, musicology of a Southeast Asian way of singing slash chanting, even non-Buddhist ways like the singing of folk songs, et cetera. That's a wonderful point. And certainly on just a bare musical level, and this also came up with your point, Elizabeth, about how this kind of alternation between male and female voices evokes a whole other range of musics outside of a strictly Buddhist sphere. But the kind of musical characteristics like the mode, the scales that are being used, as well as the kind of um, vocal ornamentation that's being applied is something that would, we would find outside of this sphere as well. And so for every poem and any particular meter in any particular mainland Southeast Asian context, there's always multiple ways to recite it, multiple melodies or cadences that can be applied, each of which has different kinds of aesthetic effects. Um, this particular melody is one that has long been associated with this text. Um, sometimes the name of this melody is the Mun Liang Sarai Mahami Yi, or the melody associated with the lamentation of uh, Queen Mahamaya, that is the Buddha's mother, uh, prior uh, to her. Well, it's actually the lamentation of her when she's having passed away seven days after the Buddha's birth and looking down from. Uh, the heavens and seeing that he's practicing this dukkura kirya, these kinds of um, excessive asceticism mm -hmm. and, and starving himself. That's the particular Khmer context, but we see it in other circumstances as well. So mm -hmm. just to give you another example of the same melody, um, this text of uh, called Maknam Sarai Mahami Yia Tempuh Niang Gautamai, or the guidance or the words of admonition of uh, Queen Mahamaya for uh, Mahapajapati Gautami, um, the Buddha's uh, uh, aunt who becomes his, who raises the Buddha. And so here's an example of this melody. Hai niang gautamai Little sister Go to me. Hold to these words of guidance. I ask you now to receive. Little sister, forgive me, since giving back. And so that's essentially the same melody uh, that we saw in the other text, but it has a different resonance in the context of this narrative. Um, but equally, any other kinds of melodies could be applied. If this was a secular poem in a more secular context, one might have a much simpler melody applied, something like. Um, um, and those, that melody, though it's 
in the same tradition and has similar kinds of characteristics is very different than the long drown out sounds of and so that uh, ha what's happening musically is really important to consider. What I, I found in trying to study the texts that Outran and others labeled as evoking Samvega versus those that were um, labeled as evoking um, Pasada um, was that there were certain kinds of, of patterns. Um, and those patterns were particularly connected to scale and tonality when approximating the melodies onto a Western system. And so those that were primarily associated with the evocation of some Vega had these kind of uh, dominant scales, either minor or major dominant scales or sort of combining the two together. So we get this fundamental scale of something like as the, this basic scale that we see throughout all different kinds of uh, Cambodian music. Um, but here, um, it's not a fully articulated system like in the idea of ragas in a, in a South Asian context, um, but we see these certain kinds of associations where if we compare this to the um, melodies associated with Pasada, um, we have... Uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the melodies associated with Basada are those that uh, have a, a different kind of um, uh, tonality associated with them. So usually this kind of um, major pentatonic scale or sometimes a few other uh, notes added within that context. So just to give an example of what that would sound like, so we can sort of contrast a little bit between the sound of Samwig and the sound of Posada as articulated within the Cambodian tradition. Here's an example, uh, this particular text, uh, Lotus Flower Offering, um, has a melody that goes something like this. And again, these melodies tend to repeat every stanza, but that's one that uh, is associated with these other kinds of um, aesthetic understandings of what's going on. Questions about any of this before we move on to some other texts? Okay, well, I'm going to say something really Please. irrelevant. Okay, so with Gamelon, you know, there's yeah. two, there's a slentum and then there's a pelog. Mm. And the pelog makes you feel creepy up and down your spine, mm. and it's much older. Mm. And so, which is any of these older, or do we know? It's really hard to tie particular musical practices, particularly ones that are intangible, mm -hmm. I mean, organology is something we can yeah, study over yeah. time in Cambodia, but recordings only go back so far, yeah, sure, no notation. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's challenging. This particular text uh, was one of the ones that we we're looking at the other day and goes back to, the, to at least the beginning of the 17th century. Um, and is some of the earliest 
sort of evidence uh, for um, this kind of tradition in Cambodia. Um, but obviously the themes of Samblega show up all the time in even earlier inscriptions yeah, as well. Does that, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's hard to, for me, figure out so we don't, which we don't, one is. No, ethnomusicologists have worked out. Old. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Certainly this scale uh, that's associated with Samblega, that one is associated with the, with, there are two major traditions of Khmer traditional music, mm -hmm. just to take the Cambodian uh, case for an example. One are those that are uh, the music used traditionally for weddings and for spirit possession ceremonies. Um, sometimes referred to as Vong Pling Khmer Boran. This set of instruments, which are instruments we've known have been used in Cambodia for a very long time, um, uh, represents one tradition that usually uses scales similar to that first um, chant that we heard. Mm -hmm. Then there's another tradition, uh, which is, we know is actually very old and has been in Cambodia a long time, but sometimes, uh, Today it's called Pling uh, Bin Piet. But in the past, sometimes Pling Bin Piet, sorry, Pling Bin Piet is called Pling uh, Siam or Siamese music. That's anathema to a modernist or particularly nationalist <laughs> sensibility to think of this as Thai music because it's very clear evidence that it's been used in Cambodia since the Angkorian period based on yeah. organology. But it's there's a clear contrast musically between the, the styles. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely that also applies to what's happening with regards to the notes and scales that we see happening. One example, that the one that the Bin Biet uh, type, we have this uh, art historical evidence for it going back to the Angkorian period. But the other form, uh, is usually assumed to be even older, to be somehow pre- um, uh, it's the Yes, yeah. Yeah. but it's hard to say, you know, what has been changing over time in that context. Oh, no. But that does, it could have this resonance of something that's older within how people perceive it. And I think that's what's particularly relevant. Mm -hmm. I have to ask how the hell do they know Belloc's older than Santa? But yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Like, yeah, yeah, that's your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah, thank sure. you for that. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So let's let's look at some other texts, and we'll continue our our conversations in in that vein. So um, I'm going to bring us now to um, looking at. So we were just thinking about some Vega in the context of the life of the Buddha. So let's look at a couple of texts that uh, deal with the life of the Buddha, but are also associated with uh, some Vega. Mm -hmm. So this one begins with two words in Pali, yo, wo. Um, these, this is actually part of a quote in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Uh, and so that's what it's evoking is this broader scriptural context. Um, and in this particular scene in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, this is the last um, sermon uh, of, of the, the prior to his passing away into uh, Parinibbana. Uh, is his guidance to his uh, attendant Ananda saying that you know, I'm, I'm going to die. After I die, after I pass away into Nirvana, it's up to you uh, and all the other uh, of, of my disciples to carry on the, 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 the teachings. So this is a song that's on the surface about the life of the Buddha and about this very important moment. But this, like many of these other kinds of songs today are performed typically in funerals. And so it's also about the life and the death of the people who are there and grieving at that funeral. It's not explicitly saying that, but that's the context in which everyone is participating in. Um, so this one uses a different melody because it's in this um, this five six five six Brahmukut or Brahma song meter. Um, there are traditionally twelve melodies associated with this meter. Uh, the one that's associated with this text is actually named after this text. It seems to be a, um, a kind of locus for this locus classicus for this meter, and the melody goes something like this. I'll just do it in English here. Uh, 
aggregates will break down and dissolve. Stay, stay, Ananda. Contemplate your own life. These days, your body is brittle as fired clay. It won't last for long, bound to break in pieces. Please, dear Ananda, contemplate this deeply. When I pass away, you will spare my teaching. Truly, this dharma remains with anyone whose heart is bright and clear. That is, whose heart is characterized by basada who follows what I teach. Now the realized one, that is the Tathagata, shall end in Nirvana. Time's curse comes cruelly to crush and cut off life. What do you notice about this text? So the phrase is whose heart is bright and clear Bright and clear is actually Posada. So the I think the Kamai there is uh, Let me just uh, confirm that that's true. Sasna uh, that truly this Tarma, or the religion of the realized one, Tat Prakat Nagna, truly remains or is made manifest in anyone, Nayamian Chat that has a heart, a chitta, which is chreya, which means cleared, cleared away, like cleared away from any kind of uh, pollution or defilement, and tla, that is bright. And this term chreya tla is the kamai, the constant kamai translation of pasada. Interesting. Interesting. So, whereas uh, kamai uses the loan word sambe to do for sambega, yeah. for pasada, it doesn't very rarely use, actually says pasada or pasada. Almost always uses sakarai kreatla to describe that. So, really describing the sense of again, kreat, like kreat, the way a clear pool of water is clear to the bottom and it's been cleared away of anything that would get in the way of being able to see to the bottom, and tla in the sense of being uh, shining with, with light. That's the, the sense of, um, of these terms. So, combined together, evoking the sense of something. Anything else you notice or have questions about? Stay, stay, Ananda. Where, where, where is he being asked to stay by his side? Stay in the sense of uh, hold yourself together. Okay. Let's see what the text says. Which stanza is this now? This is the third. The third, okay. I'm, I'm the Thakud. So I, the Thakda, the realized one. Um, the five aggregates belonging to me will be extinguished. Uh, na anon. That's the sense of stay, stay, ananda. So, no just means remain, and jo makes it imperative, and na is an emphatic. So, no jo anon. Um, stay, uh, be. He's saying, don't grieve, don't lose yourself in this, um, 
and then that follows the next phrase, uh, strive hard, come to to contemplate um, within your own anga, within your own prana, within your own body. That's the sense here. But it's not a common phrase in Khmer, no um, joke. It's a, to me, it's really striking that it comes out here because it's, it's evoking this sense of, you know, Ananda is the one who's at this time has not yet achieved the arhatship mm. among the Buddha's close disciples. So he's very much shaken by the Buddha's passing away. Mm -hmm. um, and the Buddha is in a sense trying to talk sense into him. Mm. At least that's how I read what's happening in the text. Mm. And by extension, everyone listening to this at the funeral is, uh, you know, called upon to identify with Anna. Yes, uh, that's absolutely, nice. absolutely, yeah. So let's uh, take a look at another text in the same vein, um, the Buddha's passing away. This has a, a, a different melody. Um, you get a sense of it while you get a chance to read it here in English. Let's see, you can see the five stamps. That's good. Ramna Kalang Prangtrong Yi. So after describing the Buddha's funeral, we get this scene with Anand Ananda again. Meanwhile, his attendant Ananda was out for alms. Men and women from the town bowed low before him, as before Ananda, and asked, Venerable Ananda, the worthy one, our great Lord, has not been seen night or day. Where is the Lord the, the God? We're used to seeing you, always walking in his steps. Today we've lost Mara's foe. Our teacher has disappeared. Ananda couldn't bear their grief. Hearing them ask for the Buddha, the Lord they'd never see again covered his face with his palms. The all-wise one won't arrive since he's entered nirvana. We've lost our Lord, the master. That's why you see me alone. Such is our miserable fate, bereft of our beloved prince. From this day on till forever, we'll only meet with suffering. This is a scene that doesn't actually appear in the canonical um, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, but it does appear in the, in the commentary, in, in the Pudukos' commentary. So. That's where the Khmer tradition is, is finding this scene and putting it into a, a poem like this. When they're describing the day that the funeral happened, um, I have two questions. Yeah. One is like, what is the evidence for that day existing? And two, <laughs> like almost complimentary to that is, is there a like symbolic resonance in, in how they're describing the day? and what, is, what does that description convey as part of the poem? Great question. So the particular uh, date that's being given here is problematic in the sense that there's a there's a 10-year calendar and a 12-year calendar that form this cycle. Um, and there's... The particular gate date that's given here is one that's not possible, that wouldn't make sense within that the calendrical system. So something happened in the transmission of the text that, that's not correct here. Um, and with even within the Theravada tradition, there are different understandings of what the year, including the animal year, or the that's this 12-year cycle, and also the, the decimal year, this is this 10-year cycle, how that should work out and how that should be calculated to arrive at particular moments in the Buddha's life. 
that reckoning within the Theravada tradition is in disagreement with other Buddhist traditions and in disagreement with uh, different camps of modern scholars who all also have different ideas about when the particular life and death dates of the Buddha. So this has been a kind of unsolved problem for a very long time in, in, in Buddhist traditions. Um, Today, there's a, a quite close consensus about you know, when the, around the what year uh, that the um, birth, enlightenment, and our Nirvana Buddha was in the Theravada tradition. That's not exactly what's described here, except that the 15th waxing day of the month of Visakha, that, that still is understood um, as, uh, as a key date. And that's that's the most important part of for the context of what's given here, because this this chant, in addition to being performed uh, for funerals, is often one that's performed during uh, what's known as Visaka Bhujia or Visa, Visaka Puja, or what today is internationally known as Vesa. This is the uh, the holiday of the the kind of the most the most important Theravada Buddhist day within the calendar that uh, corresponds to the date of uh, birth, enlightenment, and um, uh, passing away of the Buddha. All supposedly took place on the same lunar date of the full moon day of the, I think Visaka is the, it usually falls in May. I, I think that means it's the sixth lunar month there are different ways of counting the lunar months, but that's approximately when it happens. Um, so the, by evoking the scene in this way, it's also connecting to what the audience knows about, oh, this day is important. Even if it wasn't being performed on Vesak, people know that, oh, I, this is something I know about the Buddha's uh, passing away. It's something that takes place at that particular moment. It's also something that was described as taking place at a particular time, et cetera. Um, I hope... Did that get at your question? Sure. Uh, yeah, I was also wondering about like whether the way it's described has some sort of like symbolic meaning that it's meant to like add to the like feeling of the of the poem. There are many different descriptions for what's happening with the this particular day. Um, this is not a particularly elaborate one. Other texts have much more elaborate descriptions. There's there's in fact a whole. Um, branch of Cambodian funeral music, usually instrumental, known as gong sko, or sometimes pling tai le, or sometimes pling ping to ming. Um, this form of music, according to some oral traditions about it, is meant to evoke the sound of this very scene. Mm -hmm. So the Buddha being uh, passing away, laying down between two sal trees, uh, and then having these blossoms raining down, having storms and wind happening in the background. Uh, this is meant to be evoked by the instruments of a certain kind of music that's used in a funeral uh, uh, context in Cambodia. So by again, by evoking that scene, it invokes this sonic dimension as well. I'm not sure if there's something truly that I would label symbolic per se, but if there's these different kinds of resonances that are there. Anything else about this text before we move on? Okay, so this one to give you some examples of how this idea of sambhaga or uh, stirring shows up in a context of poems about the Buddha's life. Let's now look at some texts that are really about end of life practices in a, in a Cambodian context. Actually, I did have one question. Please. Um, the yeah. very last, um, I don't know if you say like stanza or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it seems almost like um, he, yeah, from this day on till forever will be only with suffering. Mm -hmm. It's almost like uh, he feels like his like chance is gone, or like with the passing away of the, the there's like there's some something finishing. I think on the, the at least the narrative traditions around this particular moment in the life narrative of the Buddha are trying to depict a little bit the hopelessness of Ananda. That's very true. Ananda is totally grief stricken in the different sources. Um, so whether that's connected historically, but that's certainly the way the tradition depicts uh, what's going on at this moment. Um, I think there's also a sense that, that a lot of Cambodian texts are invested in, which is 
describing the temporal and geographic distance and remove from Buddhists today in Cambodia to the time and place of the Buddha. Um, so Vesak is of course a day of, on the one hand of celebration because it's, it's auspicious. These are key moments in the Buddha's life. The Buddha was born, the Buddha awakened, but it's also this, uh, the day of the Buddha's passing away. Um, it's also a reminder that uh, what remains after the lifetime of the Buddha from different Buddhist perspectives is different than what was present during the lifetime of the Buddha. Um, and so it's a reminder of that kind of long-term historical grief, if that makes sense. So let's, uh, let's take a look at a different uh, set of texts. And these are um, coming out of the same book. Let's... This is about a particular kind of funeral music, not the one I just mentioned, Gantoming uh, or Gongsko. This is one called, um, usually it's called Klong Kai. Um, sometimes it's called Klong Tna. Sometimes it's called Sko Chne. Different ways of referring to it in Khmer. Um, but the main one that's used, Klong Kai, is interesting. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's based on the Thai word Klong uh, Kai. Uh, meaning the, in a sense, the South Asian drum is the, the sense of it, because the long drum that's used is one that was at some point borrowed from in uh, an Indian or a Middle Eastern context. And uh, this uh, particular form of music we hear, um, actually, I can, I can play it for you. That will give me one sec. Um, I thought that would be possible. Let's be at the very end. Here we go. Okay. Oh, this is going to go back to the text. Thank <laughs> you. 
what do you see about the connection between that music and this poem that's explicitly evoking this music? The repetition of the first line over and over again, hmm. which we haven't really seen before. Yes, yes. And part of this, this is a modern poem composed by the um, not too, he, he passed away not too long ago uh, by a Khmer Buddhist scholar, Lee So Bi, um, that he wrote in 91, I think. Um, I believe at the in the context of the death of a family member. Okay. But something we don't see so much in traditional Cambodian poetry, but we do see in more modern forms are these kind of repeating line devices that mm -hmm. we see here. What's the deal with the pillow to the far shore? Sorry. Yeah, no, that's the boat. Where's the boat? Yeah, it's it's a very interesting line in Khmer, and I think I have the. I don't so remember the word for pillow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Let's see what it says. Um, Nipuyan Jitrawi. So Nirvana uh, mm -hmm. is the far shore. Kali Khmer Satya. Resting one's head on the pillow of the truths. Hotpitukha, free from pain, free from suffering. Man sok san gaining peace and bliss. The pillow of truth. Yeah, it's a very striking image. I've never seen it elsewhere. The only thing, you know, the wedding thing where they've got their hands wrapped up on the pillow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the only other context the only I, I think of yeah. pillows being appearing in songs because that also appears in wedding songs. Yeah. So, what's the word for pillow again? I'm sorry. Kanali. Kanali. Kanali, right here. Okay. Yeah. And so, Kanali comes from the verbal root Kali. Kali means to rest one's head on something. So, Kanali is that upon which one rests one's head, i.e., a pillow. So returning to this version. Anything else you notice about, does the music seem to evoke oh, yeah. what's going on here? Yeah, it's super haunting. Mm. It kind of like mimics the vocal qualities of the other songs, like in the way that the instruments are used. Yes, yeah. yes. So this kind of salai, this is a quadruple reed um, woodwind instrument. Um, like other quadruple reeds in the Cambodian context, it's always played with circular breathing. So that's why the sound was unbroken from beginning to end. Um, one uh, fills air into one's cheeks and then uh, is able to push air out with the cheeks and breathe in quickly through the nose so that you can attain this uh, continuous sound. I kind of feel like it's like uh, the candy and Ferrara. Mm. So it's a very glamorous way of the sadness. And it's like glorified music, the same kind of music in a very glorified, celebrated mm. way. I, mm. I don't know. I just. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I do that drum thing. Yeah. More high beat. Uh, yes. So I think that's related to Guyan's question here is the rhythm of the drum usually at this pace. So this is a drum that could be used in other kinds of settings uh, too. Um, uh, and in those settings, it would have a much more active rhythm. Yeah. Here we have this very spare rhythm. In other words, the drum is not being hit very often at all. Yeah. The other form of uh, funeral music that I mentioned, the drum is um, hit in a very irregular way that's said to evoke impermanence. Here it's it's regular ultimately, but it's there feels like there's this kind of disjointed relationship between the melody 
of yeah. this oboe and the, the rhythm of the drum. It's not in this kind of close relation. There's this spaciousness, which I think is one of the sort of the geniuses of this mm. um, kind of music, how, how it works in that context. Um, Alexander says, I've been moved by the sounds of the lyrics so far, but I think the sounds of the instruments have caused me the most shock, particularly in the last piece. Yes, yes. Whenever I, first time I heard this, and each time I hear it again, uh, I'm really, um, I guess I just feel so impressed by the, the, the intentional way it was crafted for this certain mm. kind of aesthetic effect. And Liedem writes, this drum and open performance is very similar to the current funeral dirge performed today. Um, and certainly there are many parallels in, in Thailand uh, with regards to uh, these kinds of uh, funeral dirges as well. And that's part of the reason why this very term, uh, Klong Kai, is, is a Khmer pronunciation of the Thai word um, uh, Klong, Klong Kai. Um, it's, it's presumably a form that was borrowed. Yeah. Many of these forms have been circulating between Cambodia and Thailand over the century. So mm. that's why it has these Thai names associated with it as well. For instance, like uh, uh, what's known in Khmer as Klong Chanat is related to that Chanat is, uh, uh, is a Thai word for victory because this is a drum associated with um, uh, military use in the past, but has been sort of reappropriated into this funereal context. So let's move on to some other texts in this genre. This is the one we were we were just looking at. This is just, I, I just revised the translation for the book. Um, it's the one that began with Anicca Sankar. So, sorry, can I just, yeah. I'm just maybe pause it because it, it, it just circle back to something you said in the first lecture yeah. was about what distinguishes poetry from other yeah. forms of writing. And it just seems like that there is something about evocation here uh, that is kind of unique. I'm just, you know, it's not, um, my brain's fluctuating a little bit, but it's not, it's not sort of systematic thought. It's not narrative thought. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of, um, whatever total aesthetic experience of which that also includes, you know, in which music is invited, in which that, in which evocation seems to be one of the aims, as a, you know, yes. as opposed to instruction. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And you, you could you could treat even a sort of, I suppose it's 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 a classification based on how you treat the word, you know, the the text or the the, the thing you listen to or whatever. So that to the extent that you treat its goal as evocation, you're treating it as poetry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. The role of instruction mm -hmm. of and didactic poetry within the Southeast Asian context more mm -hmm. broadly and the Cambodian context in particular is very strong, however. Mm -hmm. And as we look through a few more of these texts, we'll mm -hmm. see that what might begin with this evocation mm -hmm. of some lega that's on the surface what's going on, mm -hmm. the end often ends up in a very didactic place. Mm -hmm. In other words, does this mean that the instruction is best received when the audience has been brought into a particular mm -hmm. aesthetic or emotional place? Mm -hmm. That seems to be how the texts are structured. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this example, it begins with this uh, evocation, as it were, of this scene of death. Mm -hmm. And the particular scene of death here is one that we see in a lot of Cambodian texts, also in Thai texts from the 18th and 19th century. Whereas today we understand cremation to be the norm for the post-mortem treatment of the body in a funerary context. There are certain contexts in, South, in Cambodia, for instance, where bodies may be buried in a shallow grave for some time, even up to a period of several years before being ex ex exhumed. Exhumed, exhumed, yeah, exhumed. exhumed. Uh, and then uh, cremated often in a mass cremation ceremony, that happens as well. What's being described here though, is more the, uh, the disposal of bodies in the forest, 
Uh, this is, of course, tied to certain meditation traditions of this period and the contemplation of corpses disposing, but it also uh, seems to be outside of elite circles where cremation would have been the norm, an important dimension of funerary practice at this time. So that's why it says, discarded deep in the forest with none to trust as your own, save wild beasts who grunt and groan, you'll be alone through and through. Your wealth, the worst poverty, you can't take anything with you. You'll lie there, nothing to do body truly worthless. Mm. All merit gone in your wake, your kin will take your carcass to woodlands cloaked in darkness. They'll leave tearless, there you'll stay. The dead must be abandoned, their bones and flesh thrown away. Their bodies bound to decay, your name, they say, soon unsaid. Reflect on this and be stirred. Stirred here is this word, sambega. Have this experience of sambega, says the text. After having evoked it, now have it. Don't be deterred, but instead take refuge in what's well said. Hear this and tread the right course. Here we then transition to the didactic portion. Give gifts, keep rules, train your heart. That is perform the three key practices of lay people uh, within the Theravada tradition. Dana, sila, and bhavana. Um, generosity, uh, morality, and uh, cultivation. Three ways to start from the source. To wipe your brow of remorse, don't do what's coarse, thus I preach. Build your merit, guard your mind, always be kind. Strive to reach all those in need, make your speech, match those who teach the true path. So just trying to bring out this example mm. of mm. how the is evoking something then mm. transitions in this key stanza. Reflect on this and be stirred. Don't be deterred. Uh, and all of these things. These rhymes in the middle. Are there other rhymes that I'm missing? Oh, so this whole thing is structured along the, the rhyme um, scheme of the uh, the seven syllable meter. This is a group of Cambodian meters that are related to the Kron meters in Thai. And they feature, um, uh, there's all kinds of optional internal rhymes, um, but the external rhymes, uh, that is rhymes that are connected to ends of lines uh, are very important. So just to look at the English for a moment. So in each stanza, the last syllable of the first line rhymes with the fourth of the second, the last of the second, uh, and the last of the third. Both of those rhyme with the fourth of the fourth. And then the last of the fourth rhymes with the second of the, the last uh, syllable of the second and third line and fourth uh, syllable of the last line of the following stanzas. All of the stanzas are linked together. Um, so uh, I don't do the rhymes perfectly, but reflect on this and be stirred. Don't be deterred, but instead take refuge in what's well said or this and tread the right course. And that course will rhyme with source, remorse, course, and this preach will rhyme with reach, speech, teach, etc. Wow. <laughs> what a pain. <laughs> Oh, if there's Gwen's got a question there. Oh, yes, please. Are there moments in certain Cambodian songs where some wag and pasada might happen at the same time? Or does one always come first, the other at the end? So just to be clear in terms of how I'm understanding what's going on, I, I'm not sure if some if pasada is even really being evoked in this text. Um, I think we see that more in a much more devotional context. Um, so it's shifting into this didactic realm, but I'm not sure if Posada is being evoked. Maybe a little bit, there's mm -hmm. that sense of it, but it's not, it's not as strong as we might see in other contexts. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, I think we see a little bit of this here, um, and a little bit later, we see the two sequentially. And it's often sequential in the course of a ritual. So mm -hmm. there may be, for instance, in the context of Buddha image consecration, there are a set of three very long chants in Khmer that are performed each two or three hours long. It takes all night. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are more some vega uh, evoking come first during the night. And the ones by the time the sun rises are more Posada orienting. Mm -hmm. But I think your question Ian, is one I hadn't thought about before. Uh, are there moments in which both are might be evoked at the same time. This is sort of the, along the lines of what Anushka you mentioned before. It's like it's sad, 
and it's it's stirring, and yet there's something joyful because there's a melody because it's it has this kind of aesthetic beauty. I think the same thing uh, that you yourself raised, Gwen, where and uh, for instance, listening when I listen to Gayao, this kind of Vietnamese folk poetry recitation. Um, there's a ways, even if it's funny, even if it, there's something joyful about it, there's something that's plaintive, that sounds mournful. There's a taste of that there as well. Mm. And I think um, there's something to understand and unpack about how our tastes and understanding mm. of what gets mapped onto certain emotions have mm. changed in many different cultures across yeah. time. Um, and I think there's also something to explore more in your, your question around you know, maybe there are moments. Let's, as we look at a few other pieces, let's see if that. Uh, I mean, might... you know, just as a, just to maybe take that question a little bit further. You know, to, in the example of the Mahavam, so that you're talking about where where you see Posada and some yes. Vega. I mean, there the two are like, and it appears at the end of all the chapters. It's not as though they're opposed in that. It's you know, it's 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 almost like as though they're both kind of evocation. You know, like that the, the reader should get that from the Mahavam. So. Posada and some Vega, that it's for the Posada and some Vega. And Posada comes first for memory in, in Mahavamsa. So thank you both. Yeah, see, thank see you guys. You. So um, I mean, is there a way it just based it kind of riffing a little bit on what you said about the the way in which emotion, you know, we're understanding, we're we're sort of mapping some Vega as a kind of a slightly negative, depressing emotion, and Posada mm -hmm. as this like mm -hmm. uplifting, joyful emotion, mm -hmm. what you just said. But I mean, it, it's entirely possible, it seems to me, if we take the Mahabam, so that they weren't seen as opposed, that they one wasn't necessarily yeah. sort of, you know, coded positive and one negative in quite the way we're making it out right now. I don't know. Um, I just am also, Eric just commented on there, isn't the promise and refuge of Dharma evoked by the, by the didactic turn at the end of the poem evocative of the serene confidence of Basada? Yes, and, yes, uh, yes. And I think that's, again, what, Gui and you were getting to as well. Um, I guess I've been very literal in reading this and only thinking where the text explicitly says, you know, things that are associated with, with Posada or uses terms like Gretla, et cetera, that I think of it in those terms, but yeah, for sure. Okay, Absolutely. yeah, there's the, there's the Mahabhamsa. Um... Yes, and the end of the yes, chapter. Pasad, this is way, Gokaram, yeah, so absolutely, it's, um, Basada comes first in the in the compound, um, so that's very interesting to think about. Um, yeah, I never really thought about that line. Basada janake thane tata samvega karake. So, um, in the places to that are give rise to that are to give rise to basada, um, and the same in those that are to give rise to samvega. In other words. Here it's saying that they're separate. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, the way yeah, the Mahalamsa yeah, yeah, yeah. is framing it. Yeah. That they're separate. Um, That's right. Uh, so let's, but it's putting them in a different order. Yeah. So many of the other traditions try to put this sequence to things where Samwega is coming first and Posada is coming later. But yeah. it's interesting that this has a different order, but still considers them separate in a certain way. Huh. So let's let's keep these questions in mind as we uh, move to. Um, other texts. So, I think, yeah, let's take a deep dive into this text Song for the Hour of Death. This is one of many um, Cambodian poems that, and we see parallels to this in, in Siamese and Lanman and Lao examples as well, but let's just focus on this particular example at the moment, um, that are designed to uh, evoke the horrors of the process of dying and what happens after death, and also connecting that to the practice of certain practices of meditation. So we have a very interesting arc that we'll go through in this text. Um, so I thought we could explore it in a little bit more depth. Usually in terms of genre, these are given the generic title of uh, meaning the uh, 
three marks. That is the marks of impermanence, suffering, and not self. Um, but there are many, many songs that have that same uh, title. Um, sometimes they're also given the generic title of Dhamma um, that which arouses a sense of stirring with regards to the teachings. So both of these kind of generic titles uh, appear for this kind of text. So this, this, the title I've given here, Song for the Hour of Death, is not actually one that appears in the tradition. It's just, I'm trying to give it um, something that describes more specifically what's going on. So it begins with this evocation of pain, of the sheer pain of coming to the end of life. Pain seizes, squeezes, and makes you sick with fevers that wreck you from within, from life to death, from death to the void. Your body knows but constant change, unchecked, short-lived, bound to decay, once light, now dark, once rising, now falling. And in that, it tries to capture what's happening in this process of aging. Your voice sang clear, but now it's hoarse. Your eyes once ranged both far and near, but now they've changed and all grows dim. Your hair once gleamed black and oil, but now it's dull and gray as ash, white to the tips like river grass buds. Your teeth once snugly meshed together, mashing your food without a hitch. Now your gums swell, your teeth shake. They slip from the roots and fall from your mouth. Whatever you eat, you can't bite it through. You chomp down and swallow, fearing hunger. Your ears grow death. Your supple skin, once tightly wrapped around your flesh, goes slack and droops while beauty remains. Your body's parts aren't really you. And here it's transitioning to thinking about this idea of mm. anatta or not self. You can't even call them your own. And we begin this very interesting conversation. To love them's useless. What refuge are they? You coax your hair, stay as you are. Don't go gray, but your hair won't listen. You woo your teeth, stay as you are. Don't fall out, your teeth won't listen. You bleed with your ears, be kind to me. Don't go deaf, your ears won't listen. You beg your eyes, weeping and wailing, entreating the gods to offer their blessings. Dear eyes, have mercy, stay as you are. Don't go dark, but your eyes won't listen. Then we have this graphic description of how death is being imagined um, itself. Death, this is here being uh, understood as King Mama. Yama, yeah. or Yumuriyat in Khmer. And uh, his troops are these uh, Yama, Yama Bala, Yama Pubala, sometimes known as other kinds of uh, phrases that describe these uh, figures, but those who are Guy. The, they're the servants of Yama the, the, who are uh, in, usually in Theravada context understood as real living beings, but who are either sort of guardians of the hells or are managing this, this process of, of uh, rebirth. Death, our foe, rallies his troops to storm and swiftly and seize your body. They grasp your head, hands and feet and down your waist and never let go. They grip your chest, squeeze your heart, pinching the 32 vessels within. They knock you down and tie you up, plunging you forward, pulling you forward, pushing from behind, tugging and tossing you left and right. Crumpled and pummeled, you wither in pain by agony crushed, by anguish beat, tormented, tortured relentlessly. Your chest contracts and blazes red hot. Thick phlegm creeps up, crowding your throat. The body's four elements, same elements we were looking at in the other context of earth, um, water, uh, wind, and fire, um, slink away, but your mouth sticks open, gasping for air, your nose all clogged, your last tears dry. What a struggle to breathe. The wind element slips away, tying your vessels and knots. Your eyes roll back. As you shiver and shake and quake inside, pursued to death by death. Is that is that pun or not pun? But is that uh, said repetition and uh, by uh, death? Uh, no, it uses um, either. I can't remember now whether it's Yama or Yama's guardian. So it's, the the, the uh, pun okay. is not there. So modernum by the Yama. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Oh, that's interesting. Then we get this description of what happens after death. So one has to imagine the context of this whole poem is reciting for someone who is sick. Um, 
this wouldn't ordinarily be recited in a funeral, but rather for someone who was, who was alive, for those who are caring for someone who was alive, but who, who is dying. And they're given this preview of what, what death is like. Your snot, once yellow, turns black and sticky. Your body stone grows, noxious and foul. Strangers haul your corpse to the woods, throwing you out like trash without regret. And here we- Sorry, can I ask this one of the question? Is yeah. the you, is the second person pronoun that that is it that it's in there you in most cases it's not necessary to state a pronoun yeah in these particular my sentences right um so uh there it's not clear or, or would in the verbal form or whatever it's in the verbal it's, form it's uh, it, the verbs don't conjugate in my um right so it's it's really ambiguous. So this is right. Okay. I think there are places where it's clear that this is really this. It's calling out in a second person address. Yeah, it's yeah. Very common in yeah. these poems, saying, "You listen. This is what's happening yeah. to you." Um, but it doesn't. Re in English, I have to repeat "you" much more than yeah. is in the original. Okay. Text. Sorry to interrupt. I just no, no, very no. striking. Like it's freaking me out a little bit. Yeah. yeah I, I, <laughs> sorry, but it, it, is, it is only the theme. The theme of the day. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go on. It is the theme of the day. We'll go on to something okay. more pleasant uh, tomorrow. But um, in the charnel grounds, your body's forlorn beneath gibbons, civets, and flying squirrels, hounded by wolves, tolls, and wild dogs. Um, and this is evoking this sense of the forest as a place of danger, of great danger. It, completely different than the world of uh, lowland rice cultivation. The forest is um, outside of the scope of, of civilization. Oh, a doll. That's oh, a doll. They, they're actually quite cute. Yeah. The, the picture on the left. Uh, it's like a fox. Do you know that? Oh, never know what a doll is. I bite oh. owls, osprey, and circling hawks whose hoots and screeks shrieks resound in the woods. And of course, owls and these other kinds of birds being evoked here are ones that are often framed as scary and associated with ghosts within a mainland Southeast Asian context. <laughs> Hemmed in by crows and circled by gulchers who summon a flock to join their feast of gore. Soon all these beasts rush in to peck and hack, gnawing and tearing your corpse to shreds. They mob en masse as your last entourage. Let me just skip this, it gets really gory. This is um, <laughs> going to go into the decomposition of the corpse. So that's what, that's what happens next. Um, where the worms burble within. Uh, let me just skip it uh, with, with your permission. Um, then we, we move into this reflection on back to this world of the living person. You can't control this body for it's not yours. Reflect on this carefully, ponder it well, see the path before you, don't be careless. And this is a part that's very interesting from a gendered perspective. Usually the way that this, these texts are framed is with a male um, point of view in mind. As far as I can understand what happens in the next passage, uh, it's with a, uh, a woman's perspective in mind. You bathe yourself, put on a lace hem skirt, an embroidered silk blouse, a blended scarf, smiling and thinking you're not too bad. You trim your hair, uh, massage it with oil and shave the sides so you can show off. And in the 18th and 19th century in Cambodia, this was the particularly elite women's fashion, but I think it also uh, would have extended to other people in society that hair would be left on top of the head, but um, shaved off as a kind of the, 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 I forget what this is called in modern day. It's cool again. Yeah, yeah it is cool, cool again. Top yeah. <laughs> oh, knot. Yeah. Adorned with gold and gleaming with jewels, you walk with grace, swinging your arms. You never stop preening, but this body is loathsome, its fate disgusting, certain to decay. Take a moment to think it over, to think it over. Then we get the rest of the text that goes into this framework around uh, certain practices of meditation. Um, I think this is where we can also ask this question of, is there this, you know, maybe the Samvega Pasada framework isn't totally germane to what's going on here. There could be limits to that framework. We might want to think about other things. Or even this framework of evocation and instruction, uh, are these blending together in some way too? How, you know, maybe there's something else that you can, you all can see in this text that will, will help us understand it. But I think it's uh, 
useful um, for us to just um, go, th go through it. We won't do every bit, but just give you a flavor of what remains. So one is being asked then to reflect on the fragile body and then to not think of uh, normal thoughts of attainment. Don't think of the pleasures of men and women, gold and silver, horses and elephants, buffalo and cattle are rising in rank. Um, these are all would have been signs of status and pleasure at that time. These thoughts are futile. Such attachments bind your neck, waist and ankles, your whole body shackled like a thrice bound corpse. And here it's a direct connection to Cambodian funerary practices. I don't know actually if this is done in a Lao or Thai context or other places in the Theravada world in Sri Lanka, et cetera. But corpses are traditionally tied um, three times with a, a cord around uh, the neck or head, different contexts, uh, cords around the, um, uh, the waist, uh, sometimes connected to the wrist, and then with the ankles as well. Um, and so sometimes those are described as different kinds of attachment, attachment to spouse, attachment to children, attachment to wealth as being the things that uh, bind uh, people at, at death. Hmm. Rare are those who can loosen these cords, says the text. To succeed and reach complete freedom, you must study the 45 subjects the master selected for meditation. Now, I don't know what the 45 subjects are. Uh, in the Visuddhi Magda, for instance, 40 is the number of subjects. So what is meant by the 45 subjects is um, for specialists in meditation texts like what I made to, to figure out. Um, clear your mind and concentrate well on the lucid guidance of your teachers. Filled with pity, they admonish you to vanquish the evil trapped within and abandon all five of the obstacles. These are these new arana, these obstacles that are brought up in a meditation context. Quick, cast them off. Don't let them get near. You might get stuck and fail to progress. Having gained the hard-won jewels of virtue, and this is a connection to this idea of the luong kao, uh, these, um, or luong kao in a, in a Thai context, the, the, the jewels that are, or the glowing spheres or glowing orbs that are tied to esoteric meditation practices that involve the visualization and manipulation of these kinds of uh, orbs within the body. So having gained them, in other words, having succeeded in this kind of meditation practice, hold them tight. Don't uh, keep them safe and secure. Don't be a fool and forsake the manual um, that guided you this far. Uh, don't let your mind wander. Don't hold grudges. Don't be sly. So we're getting into this very didactic section. The sages of old learned, upheld, and vowed to realize the truth of the Buddhist teachings, completely detached. They accrued good deeds and strove to cast off numberless evils. They rooted the dharma in their bodies, aiming to one day reach its highest fruits, that of arhatship, uh, Buddhahood, etc. All doubts they severed, all sins they ceased. Fletchers of the mind, they true the resolve. Their aim was sure to complete their practice and find real bliss before life's window shuts. And here we have, again, another metaphor to describe the attainment of these kinds of uh, jeweled orbs. Um, and the way to guard them in life. So this is, again, an end of life uh, kind of text, but it's perhaps designed for a lay man or a lay woman, uh, given the different uh, resonances we hear, who has practiced certain forms of esoteric meditation earlier in their life. And now that they're coming to the end of their life, they're asked to recall that practice and uh, bring it up at this most propitious moment. Should you succeed in meditation, you're certain to win a divine prize, that is to attain the heavens. Uh, once you've mastered the true practice, keep it fixed and firm within your being. Suppose you had a hoard of gold and gems all scrolled away in a secret cache. If you were able to protect it well, your treasure would keep you secure for life. But if you were to relax your guard and spend a little here, a little there, soon your vast riches would be scattered and you'd be ruined worse than before. This is just like one who wins the Dharma and gains freedom, yet can't live up to it. Resting on success, he loses his zeal. And here I've inserted the pronoun. Um, uh, maybe if I was translating again, I might have just put they throughout all of this, but the, the Khmer does not specify the gender of uh, this particular student. Resting on success, he loses his zeal. Unstirred by urgency, 
he fails to strive and keep up all the progress he's made. He assumes that now he's a master with vengeful karma, this idea of um, uh, or um, uh, in the Khmer context, all melted away. That is no possible negative consequences to that might unexpectedly arrive in the future. He can just be careless uh, with his body and not bother to think things through. One can never cheat the price of bop or sin in this context. Don't doubt this, for evil fast accumulates when you fail to hold yourself upright. When you take up the dharma, be careful. Study the mind, keep it pure, stick to truth. Deepen your tolerance and compassion. Find the path of kindness from within. Take care of yourself. Be steady, settled, follow your teachers. Don't mess around. Then we have this next paragraph, I won't go into it, um, but it's really connected to this broader genre in Khmer literature of these didactic poems, Tpap Tun Mui and Kluan, uh, poems for the uh, admonishment or the training of oneself uh, that could be used in simply the moral training of young people or those preparing for a particular government positions, etc. cetera. Um, this kind of ethical literature is foundational within the Cambodian literary context. Um, there are some similar genres in the central Thai uh, arena, but they're not as central within that uh, literary tradition as we see in the Cambodian context. But a very clear sort of uh, didactic basis for how is one supposed to behave. Um, and some of this could be some things that one could use at this end of life context. Some of it seems to be extending beyond that because other people would be listening to this as well. Um, and then it ends with this Ani Sangsa, like if you were able to do all this, and it's a very, very long list of things, you'll have nothing to fear. If you study these teachers with care and a pure intention, again, back to this idea of intention being central, you need not doubt. Should you aspire to reach the heavens, soaring above in distant Brahma realms, or even return back here in human form, your hopes and prayers shall be fulfilled. And then a short summary of what this was all about. At last, this exposition is complete. The facts that haunt our lives are plain. Constant change, ceaseless pain, nothing to call our own. Again, the three marks. Now these wise words must end. I'm gonna start now. Go go meditate right now. <laughs> <laughs> Get some vegan man. <laughs> Trent, uh, Alexander's got something there. I am wondering if there is a tendency for Buddhist doctrine to subvert tropes that are typically associated with hardship to instead represent auspicious occurrences. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. The one what I'm thinking of in particular is earthquakes and its employment in the Lotus Sutra to signify the shattering of illusion, ignorance, etc. Um, and if we go back to um, that uh, that text uh, uh, that we looked at on the uh, maybe even the first day, uh, no, the second day uh, when we were thinking about prayer. Uh, we saw that an earth, uh, earthquakes yeah. appeared as well. Um, at that moment, this is after the king ordains, the whole lore around that is the earth uh, quaked in all directions. Mm -hmm. We see images of earthquakes, rainbows, uh, all kinds of other atmospheric phenomena being tied to particularly auspicious moments, but particularly ones that are somehow consequential, like the ordination of a particular figure or the passing away of a particular religious figure. This is very common in a, in a Buddhist context. Um, but I think the, the general thrust of your question might be getting at something else. And I, I haven't thought about that before, about sort of uh, things associated with hardship um, being reframed yeah. as uh, auspicious occurrences. Well, like, like the Vesantara Jataka is the perfect example, right? And mm -hmm. this is all... You're sort of you're sort of the horror at the story of Vesantara is you're called upon to sort of hold it in abeyance in a way, or at least at the, at the didactic level of the story. I don't mm. know if the, at the performative level, maybe not, but um, I, I had a similar kind of reaction to Alexander. 
Um, but of course, you know, the some Vega style is, is precisely the polar opposite, right? Is to reconsider everything good as bad. So it's, it, it, but I, I, I would agree with you, Alexander, that my, my experience of verse and or the limited verse I know in the context I'm most familiar with is, is like Alexander's and that, yeah. But bad is good. Bad is good. Yeah, yeah, all is these, it, yeah. Is to leave it behind and flood under. But it's much more Posada like, you know, much more Posada like in its thrust. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, Anushka, what would you say? Like, have you, is your experience of, I don't know, religious literature in Sri Lanka, do you see a lot of, have you experienced a lot that's like the Samvega evoking? I think that. Uh, earlier versions of Buddhism, it's kind of like suffering and sangvega and fear. Mm -hmm. Now, when it's like in, in my groups I'm studying, mm -hmm. like when they're more into conventional practices, then they will be like sangvega and ghosts and other realms and fear, uh, all these things. Mm -hmm. But in more modern sense, it will be pleasure and how you should enjoy life and moments and it's like because you know things so then you should be happy it's that mm. kind of a thing mm. so it, it's like the perspective i guess that's right. that's i don't know maybe, mm. maybe it makes does it make sense I don't know. absolutely absolutely yeah 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 i think we see those kinds of patterns all across uh mm. the buddhist world 20th century 21st century very very common to see that kind of transition taking place and let's let's keep that in mind for tomorrow when we think about pleasure and buddhist poetry and do those ideas around pleasure that you're seeing in some of the groups you study um do, does that show up in any of the poetry we'll look at so it's a supernatural and the ghosts is that to give you some some bigger kind of fear i think yeah. it's just like you will go and end up in those realms so it's got a, yeah i mean it's like those hell murals and those hell statues they're supposed to shake you up and yeah, yeah, sort of didactic and didactic. kind of descriptive like about how worms are coming out of yeah, your yeah. mouth and yeah. then how light is only there in your body and if you still lies then your face go dark and people can't see your face but your body is a light. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Guyen's got a, a comment. And then, Great. Yeah. Uh, in the rituals that last the entire night, is exhaustion a part of the <laughs> affect <laughs> that goes through the participants in the end? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, or does the repeated shock slash horror of these songs energize the body somehow? That's really interesting. Um, so that's that ecstatic shamanic thing. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a bit of both. You said definitely the exhaustion is part of it. Can yeah. you tell us more? I mean, I just, I, I would, I, I mean, I do believe that, the, yeah, again, the particular the total ritual experience or whatever that in which this is something like this would be performed, that, yeah, certainly the, the kind of... Um, the breaking down of... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Joker the Gamelon teacher says, you do a shadow puppet thing, you, you can't pee the it's whole night. A perfect example, right? <laughs> yeah. Got it. I'm sure Together. you could do a two hour version, right? <laughs> he says, no, you can do 30 minute versions. Yeah. And these kinds of all night rituals, Guian, are less and less common in Cambodia today because they don't necessarily accord with contemporary schedules or mm. relationships to time uh, in Cambodia. Um, I've certainly experienced them in a in a public way, in a Vesak context in mm. Cambodia. But the last time I sort of stayed up all night at one of those, I stayed up half the night in 2016. And, but 2006 was the only time I remember actually chanting with people until dawn. Um, I think I, I, I personally was exhausted, um, but there is a kind of energy that comes from uh, this, this chanting. Um, what I haven't experienced is the, the, an all night ritual for a end of life kind of ceremony, because that tends to be something much more private. Um, and I haven't done 
that kind of uh, in-depth field work around uh, those particular kinds of rights. It's part of why I've been hesitant to write too much about what's, what's happening in that context, because uh, I'm getting it secondhand from teachers who describe it, as well as books in the early part of the 20th century that are describing in detail how these rituals take place, but they're again much less common today. Um, Eric, you're asking in principle, as I understand it, a piercing realization of any of the three marks of existence can trigger feelings of samvega. But do Southeast Asian Buddhist poems seeking to evoke samvega tend to foreground or prioritize any of the three marks of existence more than the others? Mm -hmm. I would say that it's particularly the first two that get emphasized. What we saw in this last text is quite interesting that it really has extensive sections dealing with anatta. That is unusual in the, in the text that I'm familiar with. There's much more on the impermanence of the body uh, and maybe this idea of asubha, of the foul, the impure, which I'm not actually sure how to categorize into the three marks. Mm. Um, in other words, is the decay, or witnessing a body decay, which of the three marks does that really fall under or imagining one either uh, dying in a painful way or being uh, after one has died, one's corpse being abandoned in the forest. Is that ultimately about any one of the three marks more than any of the others? I find this you know, challenging to figure out. Probably on each other, right? All right. Yeah. yeah. Makes, seems to make yeah, sense. Trying. And that's the one that has, of course, entered most um, concretely into the vernacular language um, uh, as something that you know we see in all kinds of other poetry. Well, with uh, uh, Anita has this sense of alas or pity this, or mm -hmm. in, in the way that might be understood in a another kind of context outside of the Buddhist form. Um, and then you've written again, Eric, that is my sense as well. Are there many cases of poems evoking some way to go through anatta? And as I mentioned, it's really this text that we just looked at, this song for the hour of death um, that had particularly those passages on, uh, you know, you're coaxing your hair, stay as you are, don't go put your hair, I won't listen. This is sort of a, a even in canonical understandings of anatta, this is part of the idea. It's like mm -hmm. one can be sick, but you can't control that sickness of your body. So mm. therefore the body is somehow not you uh, or the same for thinking about the other five aggregates, et cetera. So mm. that's one way in which um, anatta gets, gets foregrounded, but it's, mm. it's, it's, it's rare. So would this be sung at a funeral? As far as I understand it, this is for an end of life. End of life, so yeah. Bamsbo or end of life? There's not a particular Cambodian word for this ritual, um, but it's for someone, um, so when they're someone there, who is very uh, yeah sometimes it's I'm trying to think of a Khmer phrase to describe it so so um, chant the dharma to someone who's of low energy which means they're at the very advanced state of illness and and Thai would be something like so high boy something like for those who are at a very serious still stage of illness reciting the Dharma to them but I don't think even in Thai there's not a it's not a word to describe this ceremony um, and I don't see the contemporary practice of, of the in life but when people are in the hospital when they're hooked up to everything then doesn't the monk come and there's a candle or the English um at the head I, and everybody I freaks out I no, no, it's um. I don't know if that is um the chant for the end, end of the life in Thailand. Um, I, I mean, it, in my understanding of the manuscript tradition in the 18th and 19th centuries, so um, particularly Leporello manuscripts, the ones that are um, uh, I'll, I'll make this visual. It will be easier to understand. Um, sorry, let's take this moment. Maybe I've put it in an endless scroll. Sorry. This is the book you're working on. Uh, sorry, just passed the part I was trying to get to. 
so it's like the Cambodians here, like they actually pay to bring the monk down to chant something when somebody's in the hospital. Yeah, we, we, we have that, that, that ritual too, but it's but it's right. Uh, but what I understand is there is no um fix or particular text to be used in that circumstance. Never asked. So there's kind of general Buddha text that yes. would be, be used. Yeah. There's also some be specific be kind of Buddha text that would be used in a Cambodian context. So for instance, the Kiriman on the Sutta, Kiriman on the Sud, um, the Isi Kili Sud, um, that um, I, my computer is not cooperating. But um, there are, what I was going to show you is that there in 18th and 19th century Thai uh, manuscripts, uh, there are illuminations that show these kinds of practices taking place. So they're often sometimes connected to the Pratmalai manuscripts, but they're uh, in a slightly different genre because they contain texts and contain ritual instructions that are about chanting for uh, the end of life. So, so this is how it's depicted in a Cambodian context. Yeah. Um, uh, so the person is, sorry, forgive. So it's supposed to help your your soul, your Venian migrate, right? Yeah. So that's one 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 dimension of it. But the the key way the texts themselves frame it is how does one maintain uh, toward the very last moments of life, to the final moment, uh, a thought that's that is a that it's centered on the Buddha or on something else that's wholesome. So one is maybe asked to reflect on the merits that one has performed in life. And then the texts around Cambodian end of life practices uh, tend to emphasize at the very end, the person should recite uh, Buddha, Buddha, or if they're not able to recite themselves, the, uh, the lay officiant or the monastic can recite uh, Arahang, Arahang to them. Uh, so it describes sort of uh, this sort of narrowing of practices as the various faculties of the person uh, begin to slip away. And the Cambodian practices are specific about how to prepare the room, how to lay down the person, where to set up the altar, how to clean other things away. And uh, both monastics and lay people might be chanting to them uh, in this kind of context. And uh, we see similar depictions in a Thai context. So this is one example. Uh, here's uh, someone who's depicted as ill in a Thai context. Um, this is for a Sadat Kra uh, ritual, um, but there are other portions in this same manuscript, this manuscript from the British Library, early 19th century manuscript um, that depicts monastics chanting uh, for someone who is ill. And the kinds of texts that appear in that context are, are the, you know, the ones we mentioned around the Giriman and the Sutta, et cetera. Here's think, another example of the, the same kind of depiction. Um, and uh, sometimes this text, Katha uh, Purukun, is one that appears as well, here being mentioned here. Um, uh, and but with this different kinds of medicinal practices for someone who's old being mentioned. And we know that these particular texts at this period in Thailand were recited melodically because the red annotations you see here, these are uh, indications of how melodically to recite. And this, by the way, is outside of Vietnam. This is the only form of mainland Southeast Asian musical notation prior to the 20th century that, that occurs very rarely on these kinds of manuscripts. Hmm. Or maybe they just wore out. So we need so much, so we don't have that many. It's true, yeah. true. That, that's, also, that's also possible. This is really pretty, but maybe the, the cheap ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, today we just know that uh, just for after the, 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 the date, like during the, the ceremony, mm. funeral, so we, we, we chant mm. Brahmalai. Yes. yes, but I haven't heard, haven't seen the contemporary practice of reciting. Yeah. For, uh, yeah. So it's very interesting. The same kind of pattern seems to have happened in Cambodia. Uh, the manuscript tradition shows that end of life practices and chants around them were very important in the uh, 
certainly by the time the manuscript record really picks up, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And then that declines as we move towards the present with the increasing medicalization of mm -hmm. death. Uh, we see a very similar uh, context in the Thai, uh, the Thai world. And for instance, like the work of Scott Stonington or of, uh, Felicity Olino give sort of another kind of perspective on how care for the elderly or care for, for the dying is, is changing within this medicalization of death. And of course, the medicalization of death happened on a broader scale earlier on in Thailand, particularly in urban areas, than that sort of took place in Cambodia. And it's these rituals that persist in Cambodia almost exclusively in rural areas. We're basically at the end of time. Um, some of the, we'll look at some texts tomorrow that are kind of both about shock and pleasure as a kind of bridge. Um, I was gonna do those bridge texts today, but we'll, we'll push that to tomorrow. And um, there will also be an opportunity for sort of any last questions you have, we've kind of, raised a number of different topics. You all have brought up such wonderful comments and feedback and questions. Um, and I wanna to continue to make room for that tomorrow as we look through things. I, again, I'm so grateful for all of you here and in this room and all of you um, joining by Zoom. Most of you are repeat performers coming to all of the talks this, this week. So it's uh, really grateful. I feel really grateful to um, have your presence here and all of your, your contributions again. So if you're able to make it tomorrow, look forward to seeing you then. If we won't see you tomorrow, um, thank you for, for, for coming. And uh, so long. Thank you. 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 Thank you.